So the other uh, day I was staying overnight at a house that had a uh, full-on projector and kind of a uh, almost movie theater-esque, uh, think a very small movie theater screen, like, you know, maybe uh, uh, maybe 10 feet across, something like that. But still, it was, uh, you know, pretty cool to have that. You watch some uh, movies and... Uh, much bigger than even a you know a big screen TV. Watch you know real movie theater style. So I uh, had a sudden inclination to pop on a Moonraker for for some reason. You know just uh, I I didn't specifically seek it out, but I was you know scrolling through what movies were available on sc- streaming on HBO Max I think and saw it and popped on and uh, yeah it was it was really cool to see on the uh, quote unquote big screen. You know big screen that was a uh, within a relatively uh, private setting. But yeah, I mean, I, obviously, you know, people give it shit, you know, double taking pigeon, et cetera, et cetera. But Jaws being a little bit of a Looney Tunes villain. But I don't know. On the whole, I uh, special effects in the end really hold up, I think. They, they really do. I mean, even more than a lot of most other movies from the 70s, I think. Whatever uh, technique they used of kind of rolling back the film and uh, reshooting it over and over. a lot, Like the reveal when John Barry's music is going and the light hits the space station and it, uh, you just slowly, it was revealed at the end. I think it's pretty cool. You know, I admittedly, the lasers are a little silly, the pew pew, the blue lasers. But other than that, I think, uh, people over the decades have given the movie definitely too much shit for its science fiction elements. I mean, people act like it's the one where James Bond goes and fights aliens in a, in a crystal palace on a moon of Neptune or something. No, he goes to, he goes to Earth's outer orbit and, and a space station, you know. Guess what? Earth's outer orbit is, in fact, a place that exists. And many people have been there. And there are, in fact, space stations on it. I mean, maybe you could critique aspects of it within that, you know, sending globes to destroy the population of the Earth. But I don't know. I think a, a lot of the criticisms have been over overstated on that movie. Not to say it's a perfect film by any means. I mean, uh... uh <laughs> The uh, sheer number of attempts on Bond's life get a little escalate to a somewhat a silly extent, especially when Jaws is uh, just in a clown costume and then carried away by a crowd in Rio. You know, a little, little silly, but overall, I, yeah, it's a blast to me. And, you know, my most rewatched films ever by a pretty uh, extensive margin, I would say, are kind of the, uh, I mean, there's uh, some others like Ferris Bueller and Willow and... I don't know, like uh, The Breakfast Club and The Last Samurai I've watched a lot of times, but, you know, just kind of as a group, as a series, my most rewatched films ever are kind of like what I would think of as the classic era of James Bond. And uh, people would probably have a slightly different definition for how they would uh, delineate the classic and non-classic era than me. You might have some real, some real sticklers for tradition who would say almost like the initial run of films that are actually genuinely based off their uh ian fleming novels of the same name so basically that would be dr no through honor majesty's secret service right the 60s movies only but you know most people would probably expand out a little more than that and call like the cubby broccoli era of dr no through license to kill kind of the classic era and, and that is when a lot of the uh, initial talent from the initial runs kind of uh hopped off because after that you wouldn't see any of a uh, john barry anymore uh Ken Adam, you know, uh, Maurice uh, Binder for the titles, uh, John Glenn, et cetera, et cetera. So there there was kind of like a, yeah, between like License to Kill and Goldeneye, you definitely see kind of the new blood kind of coming in. And then probably a lot of people younger, like a Bond fan who's in their 20s today, probably would kind of uh, differentiate classic era and modern era, like when we rebooted. You know, between Die Another Day and Casino Royale. But, you know, I'm one of the few I have like a different, a slightly different standard. For me, the classic era of James Bond is everything before uh, Neil Purvis and Robert Wade came in. Yeah, between Tomorrow Never Dies and The World Is Not Enough. Because at that point, that's when you stopped seeing them just try to make kind of classic James Bond movies and and kind of trying to subvert the formula. And I don't want to, like, denounce the idea of trying to subvert the formula. I think uh, franchises throughout TV and movie franchises and book franchises and video game franchises have all done very well. You know, I think everyone was happy with the way Breath of the Wild subverted the formula of Zelda, for example. But uh, at this point, if you're like a um, 
if if you're if you've just graduated from college, you know, if you're a 22 year old graduated from college, there's never been an on formula Bond film in your lifetime, really. I mean, Die Another Day. That's a Neil Purvis and Robert Wade one, and it's one I enjoyed when I first saw it in theaters, frankly. But uh, yeah, you know, even it has to kind of a uh, have like Bond being captured and going rogue. There's always the going rogue element these days, or quitting MI6, uh, this time it's personal elements. You always have to have the MI6 regulars kind of in the field in some way or another. Most of ideas that you see started right away when uh, Purvis and Wade came on with The World Is Not Enough. We didn't have Bond going rogue, but we did have uh, you know him getting kidnapped. And I kind of liked the shakeup at the time. I'd never have loved The World Is Not Enough. It's never ranked that highly for me. But I mean, I kind of am in the mix. But then, I don't know. So when I talk about how the classic Bond films are my most rewatched films ever. And I don't mean just like your kind of obvious ones, like your Goldfinger or whatever. I mean, even stuff like, you know, stuff that most normies probably don't give a shit about, or a lot of them probably haven't even seen, like, a, you know, A View to a Kill, Octopus. Yeah, I've seen those movies uh, many, 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 many times also as well. Just all of them. Some of my most rewatched movies ever. Grab any of them from, you know, your Goldfingers and, you only live twice, live and let die, your Dalton duology, Goldeneye, View to a Kill, like I just mentioned for you guys, I've watched them so many times. I say all this to lead up to that uh, No Time to Die has existed, has been a thing, has been out for about a year and a half now, I guess, more or less, a hair less than that, but you get the idea. And I have only watched that movie uh, one time, one time. I was just thinking about this because I'm like trying to write some stuff, uh, like some scripts, you know, for Bond related content for my main channel. I'm not trying to fully transition into like a James Bond channel by any means, but I have a few ideas for videos I want to do. You know, I'm not trying to be the next Calvin Dyson or Dutch Bond fan or uh, the late James Bond radio, the late great James Bond radio, any of those. But yeah, I don't know. I just I have some I have some Bond related thoughts I want to get out and definitely I'll be trying to write something do something on no time to die probably not a its own exclusive review it's a little late for that if i was gonna do that i should have done it about you know about 15 months ago but kind of something within kind of a talking about the greater series but i don't know i just i'm just kind of i feel like the bond films as they've existed for pretty long time now maybe not from right when purvis and wade took over the writing duties about, gosh, almost a quarter of a century ago now, but yeah, for almost 20 years now, they've always felt like they've had something to prove. And here's the thing I don't disagree that they had something to prove after Die Another Day, after the general negative fan and critical reception of stuff like, you know, invisible cars and tsunami surfing and Robocop suits and virtual reality and all that. It was kind of made fun of at the time even in 2002 and 2003, right after, for being, you know, just a excess, just like the Bond equivalent of just, you know, binge eating milkshakes until you vomit. Like, it was, you know, it was regarded as too much. And, well, actually, you know, if, unless you're a true Bond geek into the whole extended universe, you might not know that there was one more Pierce Brosnan story after that, that the uh, video game uh, Everything or Nothing, uh, Brosnan came in and voiced uh, Bond and everything. You'd uh, John Cleese voicing Q, Judy Dench, everything. So I, I kind of can think of that as the finale of the Bron the Brosnan series, almost like a fifth movie that he never got. But yeah, I mean, the excess of that movie, Die Another Day, is what read, led them to fire Brosnan. Still only a bon ever Bond that's ever been fired instead of quitting of his own volition. So in that context, I understand they summoned to prove with Casino Royale. And they proved it with Casino Royale, the... Uh, reception among bond fans uh, normies critics box up uh, box office uh yeah it was all like wildly positive they wanted to, so they could do something more in the spirit of fleming more serious more grounded more down to earth while maintaining kind of the uh, the luxury and the gambling and the uh you know the big brassy music and the boldness of the bond series and they accomplished it now I want to go back. I'm kind of going back in time and imagining like an alternate history where spinning off of that, instead of trying to go like even grittier and basically just make a Jason Bourne movie, a quantum of solace, they'd done what Ian Fleming had actually done after his casino Royale, which is just 
continued on with Bond's adventures as an MI6 agent, you know, going on episodic missions and taking on colorful villains like in the novels Mr. Big and the Spang Brothers and, uh, you know, Goldfinger and and, and uh, Rosa Klebb and Red Grant and all that, Dr. No. But I, in, in saying that, I don't want to say that I'm like, I don't like serialization as a thing in general. Obviously, there are series like your Star Wars or your Harry Potters or whatever where serialization and uh, serialization has worked for these various comic book movies. I personally am kind of comic book movie fatigued, but uh, I mean, it's, you can't say it hasn't worked for them. And I was on board with serialization and TV shows from early on. I like as TV became more serialized through the early OOs, that's when I got more interested in the medium. And you know, I like I love the long form kind of shows that flow together almost as like you know, 30 hour, 50 hour, 80 hour movies like uh, Spartacus or The Wire or Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones kind of went downhill at the end, but it was one of obviously one of my favorite shows of all time through a good deal of its run. So I do like serialization. But I think it plays against the strengths of the Bond series, which was like every time you get this new adventure, you know, new cast of villains, new allies, new Bond girl, new settings, new, new, new gadgets, new, new, new. You basically your continuity would be kind of like the the musical theming a little bit, your gun barrel, your MI6 regulars. But then I liked having the new stuff every time out. And that's more in keeping, frankly, with what the original novels were. If you read you know, Diamonds Are Forever and then the next novel in sequence from Rush With Love, it's not... <laughs> from Rush With Love isn't continuing with, you know, the Spang Brothers or whatever the fuck. So I'm, like, frustrated kind of with... I feel like they kept trying to prove something. And here's the craziest thing is that I feel like they did prove it a second time with Skyfall. And I remember at the time being fascinated that we were bringing in like Academy Award winning director, you know, this top cinematographers and, you know, an Academy Award winner as the villain and, and so on and so forth. And once again, I think they made it work. Now, Skyfall went down quite a bit in my ranking after seeing Spectre. If you'd asked me, like, where does Skyfall fall in your rings when I was walking out of theater in, what, November 2012, was it? I would probably said, like, top five. Like, I was uh, on a, I was buzzing with Bond Bliss walking out of that movie. I was on, like, a 007 high. But it's kind of, and then that was, I, that was such an opportunity to kind of, a, the end of Skyfall is perfect. I, like, if, if that had been the last Bond film you'd ever seen, you know, it, 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 perfect he, he went into the office with the padded door like the old school office we had we had m we had q we had money penny we had it all set up it was perfect for if after that they like every two years you know uh 2014 2016 2018 we'd had kind of like an old school classic style bond adventure they want to be a little more down to earth they don't want the sci-fi elements as much humor fine but that would have been such an opportunity and I feel like they really kind of blew it. I don't know, with Spectre, I, they, they rushed into the Blofeld stuff way too quickly. Don't even get me started on Blofeld being Bond's foster brother. That's that's terrible. And it's uh, I think that that scene of uh, where Blofeld is <laughs> outlining in Bond's foster brother relationship that is 10,000 times harder for me to watch than the kite surfing in die another day or the double taking pigeon in moonraker or anything else in classic bond that people might make fun of i i find that very difficult to watch very awkward to watch very uncomfortable to watch i was uncomfortable sitting in the theater in 2015 watching it and i'm still <sighs> Yeah, I don't know. So it's like they're constantly approaching it like they have something to prove, which is, is annoying to me because I don't think they have anything to prove. I think the fact that the James Bond film series has be stayed a healthy, popular, financially relevant, uh, financially successful, relevant film series for over 60 years now, I think that's proving something. The fact that everyone knows James Bond's signature look and favorite drink and theme song and the tropes and conventions of Bond. I, I think that's that all proves something. That that proves the longevity and the uh, worthwhileness and the frankly the iconography of the series. That's it's all proven. But they keep approaching it like we have to 
we have to Bond has to go rogue, and we have to have political subplots in MI6, and he has to he has to fall in love, and the villain they had to have a personal connection. It can't just be a villain. Oh, and of course we have to kill off Bond. <laughs> like it's like, hey, yeah, you know, you're not, you're you're making it worse, not better. Like I don't know. I mean, you can say that uh, like the Bond series and kind of the formulaic Bonds, like Roger Moore or whatever, was just like eating a fast food cheeseburger every time. It wasn't surprising, but it did go down well enough, you know. With the these new ones, it's like you're putting I don't know, you're putting whipped cream on the cheeseburger. It's like yeah, this is a little unconventional, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's better. These things don't necessarily go together. Uh, so I don't know. I just kind of. To me, it's a misreading of Fleming, honestly. And you could say at the same time, like some of the cheesier, like Roger Moore era movies were also not in the spirit of Fleming. But to me, the essence of it, which was kind of like a Bond getting the assignment and taking on the new villains of the story. I mean, that is what Fleming's approach was. Like this whole thing of Bond constantly going rogue and quitting MI6. Like there was aspects of that, like Bond and Fleming's Casino Royale wanting to quit MI6 and be with Vesper and a few things right towards the end of the books but through the vast majority of Fleming's run that's not the type of story he was writing so I just I think it's frustrating they seem so obsessed with it and uh, there's now we've they finished filming No Time to Die back in 2019 not quite four years ago because they finished filming it sometime within the year but it'll be four years since they finished filming and apparently they're not really they've not really made any progress with it Feels me like the producers have somewhat lost interest in uh, managing the series, and uh, and I find that in its own way kind of disquieting. I feel like uh, the COVID delay era that should have been the time to like get script, get a script together, get scripts plural together. Uh, to me, it would be ideally without Neil Purvis and Robert Wade. Uh, more than ideally, I think it's almost necessary at this point for the continued health of the series because I feel like. Bond 26 is gonna oh god help me however they reintroduce it it's gonna have like Bond going rogue and some sort of political subplot with MI6 god fucking forbid it tries to like comment on the modern political situation in some ways it just I like I feel it in the air like you know Galadriel his monologue at the beginning of Lord of the Rings I just I feel it coming I just I feel like Bond 26 is going to have like another chip on its shoulder. It's going to like have something to prove. It's going to try to differentiate itself in a million ways from what Bond used to be. And I just kind of, I don't know, I'm almost like preemptively mad at it, which sounds ridiculous about a movie that apparently in no way, shape or form exists yet. I'm not even going to speculate on who like should be the next Bond, except to say that I don't think it should be a sensitive artiste who uh, needs huge breaks between films and has like tons of opinions. I, I think hiring someone from the world of television is a, is a good idea. Like Richard Madden, I think uh, is an idea I've heard uh, bandied about, you know, he's done game of Thrones and he was on some show called the bodyguard. I think, I think a, a TV actor would be good for the role of bond. Cause the TV actors, they're used to just showing up very regularly on a quite regular schedule and just getting their scripts and doing their part. That's what I'd like. I think the Bond movies should come out every two years. I think that's perfectly reasonable. Yes, I know other series have longer gaps. I know, like, uh, got your five years between Mission Impossible these days. But, you know, I, I don't know. I, just, I feel like th- th- there's this whole production company, Eon Productions, that exists pretty much entirely, uh, at least used to exist basically entirely. I know they've done some more stuff lately, but pretty much used to be the Bond company and feel like a whole company's worth of people like these movies shouldn't be like you know vaporware that's getting delayed for years and years and years like i don't know i just feel like they have enough ideas people and uh producers and writers like on hand that they should be able to do like a bond movie every every two years and i think they should get an actor who's like more than willing to to do that i don't know just kind of like uh annoyed a bit lately because like I, I find it's almost the fact that the Craig, the Craigiverse, the Craig series, Casino Royale to No Time to Die, is both a fresh reboot and kills Bond off at the end, almost like kind of quarantines it off in my mind, almost as like a series that shares a main character name and certain like visual and musical motifs with uh, 
the, the series that came before, and Judy Dench, of course, in the first few films. But in its own way, it is almost like it is like an, its own series. Like I almost think of like Doctor No Who Die Another Day as like one film series now. Just like the Craig universe is like a whole separate five movie series, and like it's not one I find myself like hugely drawn to like revisit or rewatch honestly anymore. And this is coming from someone who did rewatch Casino Royale a million, who was like super jazzed about it at the time and rewatched it a million times like the first few years that it was out on dvd i mean it's probably could be my most rewatched movie of like the second half of the O's decade like 06 through 09 or 05 through 09 right i'm trying to think what else would be on that list i don't know like uh yeah i don't think i watched the dark knight as much as uh casino royale I don't know, ratatouille super bad no country for old man uh yeah, I can't think of anything I ever rewatched from that stretch of like 05 to 09 as much as Casino Royale. I've seen that movie, you know, 20 times at least. And I, I loved it. I loved walking out of theaters. I loved it on DVD. And still, when I eventually put out our, on my main channel, kind of like a video ranking the James Bond series, it'll be pretty high on the list. Easily the highest of the Craigs. Right after Skyfall came out, like I said, that and Casino would have been pretty neck and neck. But Spectre... To some extent no time to die but especially specter actually dragged skyfall down in a way that it didn't drag down casino royale but let's say even like casino royale i don't feel like any massive hurt like i as a, getting back to my very first point at the beginning of this video i just popped on moonraker the other day and i was just grooving loving every second of it loving drax loving the john barry music loving the cheesy 70s special effects Loving that Shirley Basie theme song, even if she herself uh, doesn't like it as much as the uh, gold for your and diamonds. Loving the whole, uh, the whole, uh, the, the entirety of it. Just having a great time. And I was like, if I, I also would have had a great time if I popped in uh, License to Kill or For Your Eyes Only or Goldfinger or Tomorrow Never Dies or The Spy Who Loved Me. But I just, I don't feel like I'd have the same great time if I popped in like Spectre or No Time to Die. I just, I just, don't have any particular urge to do that and i have to blame this on this fact that they feel like they have something to prove normally you want like uh people who make films or tv shows to put a lot of thought into it but in this case i legitimately feel like they're overthinking these movies and it's it's affecting them but they're asking like what are the many ways that we can subvert the series and subvert tradition and do something relevant do something relevant with the new bond and i don't know i just i feel like it's working against the series and against the kind of longevity of these movies because i i just i don't know maybe i'm wrong i don't i don't have a fucking crystal ball i'm not a time i'm not a fortune teller i'm not a time traveler i can't read the future but i'm like in 20 years are people going to be watching no time to die i don't know just i just it's hard for me to say but yeah, it's just, I just, I'm just not, I don't know. And like I said, I unfortunately just, I feel it in the air with this huge pause between movies. The fact that the work on is extremely slow. The fact that EM Productions doesn't seem to have any drive or urgency to make Bond 26. I just feel like they're going to, I just, I feel like they're going to try to do something fresh, quote unquote, fresh with it. And I'm already kind of dreading it. I don't know. So, uh. Yeah, I mean, like I said, the classic run of Bond, which for me, as I said, is like the first 18. It's like Dr. No through Tomorrow Never Dies or before they brought in Purvis and Wade. That's like my favorite film series ever and probably will be, always be, quite possibly as long as I live. I'd, I've watched them more times than I can tell you. I know so many of them by heart, practically. But I don't know, maybe going forward, Bond just won't be the series for me. But, um, but then again, I would always be happy to be proven just dead wrong on every word i've just said and have a bond 26 they feel is like classic and fun and uh just iconic in the way some of the old movies do to me but yeah anyway i just i don't know i just thinking about this because it just all stems from a weird way off of me watching moonraker and loving it the other day on the quote-unquote big screen and my kind of need to comment in some way on that and compare and contrast now and then what i think and fear about the future of bond but yeah i'll talk to y'all soon